My lords, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome on behalf of the Freedom Association to what I think is the ninth McWhorter Memorial Lecture. Uh, for some of you, of course, this is your ninth, it's my ninth, and for some of you it's your first. So for those for whom it is your ninth, please forgive me if I go through a bit of the history of this event. Norris and Ross, in whose honour this lecture is held each year, were remarkable in very many ways, academically, athletically, they both went to Trinity Oxford together, then the Royal Navy, they became sports journalists, and I don't have to mention much at all about their history with the Guinness Book of Records, which is when I first came across them through our mutual friend, the late, great Roy Castle. In fact, Norris helped me to get my own Guinness World Record, which I celebrate the 30th anniversary of next year. It has been unbeaten for 30 years. Thank you, Norris. Thank you very much, Roy. Both of them were Conservative Party candidates. Uh, Ross for Edmonton in 1964, and Norris for Orpington in 64 and 66. Where they cohere with us tonight is in the cause of freedom. I was just sharing earlier with the family how they both would have rejoiced at how the nation voted in June. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Norris sadly left the world a decade ago, 2004 after being awarded the CBE by Margaret Thatcher. And Ross was martyred for the cause of freedom when he was assassinated by the IRA in 1975. We just voted then to remain members of the EEC. <laughs> I'm particularly pleased that Rosie and Ian McWhorter are with us this evening. Thank you for coming. Your presence always elevates the evening. Thank you. When I look back at the history of the event, Lord Tebbit gave the first lecture at the Carlton Club. Lord Parkinson, Sir Gerald Howarth, Baroness Cox, Nigel Farage, John Redwood, Bishop Michael Nazo Ali, and last year, of course, Charles Moore. It sort of reads how I would like the House of Lords to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's my particular pleasure to welcome tonight's guest of honour, Martin Howe, QC. I first came across the name Martin Howe in my early deliberations on the constitutional significance of the Maastricht Treaty in about 93, 94, 95, those years when there was a profound discontent with the way the EEC had morphed into the EC and then the EU, and we had never been asked what it meant to become a citizen of the European Union. My parents and grandparents, of course, had voted to remain members of an economic union. They were never asked, should somebody be imprisoned or get a criminal record for selling a pound of bananas? I think that I know now, having spoken to him, he was on the Conservative Party's approved list of candidates, which I was then eager to get on, though I can't remember why I was so deluded. It was he who set me off on the theme of subsidiarity, Catholic social teaching, which inspired my first book on the matter, The Principality and Power of Europe. And when you read Martin's list of achievements and his publications, and the sheer dogged determination he's had over the past 20 years on this matter, we are honored indeed to have him speak to us tonight. He is an expert, an expert I might add of the sort that Michael Gove would thoroughly approve. <laughs> he knows and understands how EU law subverts UK law, in particular with regard to human rights and the Constitution. You have to wonder why he's not been a regular guest on the BBC's Question Time. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we know. He knows too much about freedom, the meaning of sovereignty, security, and justice. And he's right, or as right as a barrister may be until another barrister charges you for questioning him. 
During the recent referendum campaign, while the Rever Reverend Giles Fraser and I were interrogating bishops and archbishops through Christians for Britain, Martin was leading lawyers for Britain. I'd rather interrogate a bishop than a lawyer any day, personally. He was setting the legal basis for a successful secession from the European Union, should the people vote for it. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, the people voted for it. So tonight it's my very great pleasure to welcome Martin Howe, QC, who will speak on the subject of English legal freedoms and the British Bill of Rights. Martin. Well, <clears throat> good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very grateful for that uh, uh, definitely over effusive introduction. Um, and I'm very grateful today to be given the opportunity uh, to deliver this year's McWhirter Memorial Lecture. And my theme will be freedom and the rule of law. Uh, the McMurtor twins, uh, and of course Norris alone after the tragic murder of Ross by the IRA in 1975, were well known for bringing or supporting a series of court cases uh, the aim of which was to enforce the law in defence of freedom. Uh, a number of these cases were brought seeking to enforce the law of the land against trade unions. Uh, by the 1970s, the unions had become overmighty and prone to engaging in unlawful conduct, extending even beyond the very wide immunities which the law by then conferred on them. The political power of the trade unions uh, meant that the authorities were often reluctant to enforce the law against them, even in clear cases. Their unchecked and unlawful activities were a threat to the freedom of others, such as non-striking workers, or, in one case, the owners of cars, uh, which were left stranded on a P&O ferry as a result of strike action. But uh, of particular note um, in present-day circumstances, is Ross McWhirter's action against the Attorney General in 1972. Uh, Ross McWhirter sought a declaration that the exercise of the royal prerogative leading to and culminating in the signing of the UK's Treaty of Accession to the EEC uh, was contrary to the Bill of Rights of 1689 and therefore unlawful. His action was summarily struck out. Uh, a disposal upheld by the Court of Appeal on the grounds, in the words of Lord Denning, uh, that the royal prerogative in international treaty powers is exercised on behalf of the Crown by the government of the day, and it cannot be impugned in any way in these courts, either before or after a treaty is signed. And uh, later, in 2003, Norris McWhirter sued the Foreign Secretary, seeking to challenge the UK's ratification of the Treaty of Nice on the grounds that it would affect fundamental constitutional rights in this country. This action was similarly rejected at the leave stage by the High Court and the Court of Appeal. Uh, today, uh, we see the use of the royal prerogative powers to withdraw from a treaty being challenged on very similar grounds, which are effectively the mirror image of the arguments uh, in these two McWhirter cases. It is said the use of the prerogative power will affect individual rights, and the fact that the British people have voted for it in the largest exercise in participatory democracy in our history is irrelevant. Uh, but the attitude of the courts today is strikingly different from their attitude to the McWhirter twins' cases. Uh, instead of summarily dismissing a challenge to the prerogative power, uh, in the same way as they dismiss the McWhirter's challenges, the courts seriously entertain this, this argument on its merits. Uh, there is a striking double standard here. Challenges to more Europe are rejected, summarily and out of hand. Challenges to less Europe are treated quite differently. Uh, and this brings me to my key theme tonight, uh, which is to identify what I see as the main threat to the rule of law in this country in present-day circumstances. 
uh, the rule of law is necessary, although not sufficient, for freedom. In order to be free, it is necessary that the citizen should be protected by the law against the unlawful acts of others, such as the powerful and untrammeled trade unions of the 1970s. For this reason, it is necessary that there should not be no-go areas where the courts and judges do not exercise their powers over wrongdoers. Uh, but extending the scope of the powers of courts and judges is not the same thing as strengthening the rule of law. Um, there are many varying definitions of the rule of law, uh, but their, their essence is, is probably all the same. But the, uh, the Oxford Dictionary definition is apt. It's, the rule of law is the restriction of the arbitrary exercise of power by subordinating it to well-defined and established laws. Uh, the rule of law is therefore not the same as rule by judges. Uh, the rule of law as thus defined is as much threatened or even more threatened by the arbitrary exercise of power by courts and judges as by arbitrary exercise by the executive. Indeed, the arbitrary exercise of power by courts and judges can be more dangerous and insidious since it subverts the very mechanism which should be guarding and upholding the rule of law. And unlike the executive whose exercise of power is subject to outside control of the shape of the courts, the courts themselves are ultimately subject to no outside control and must therefore exercise self-discipline in staying within the proper scope of their powers. Those powers are to interpret and apply the law as laid down by the legislature or by the constitutional instrument in countries that have one, not themselves to make new law. It is, of course, not always easy to define the precise boundary between these activities, but it is clear beyond argument that many courts today have gone beyond that boundary, however you define it. The term judicial activism can be used as a euphemism, but this tendency could be more accurately described as usurping powers that do not belong to the judiciary, or even as assaults on the rule of law by judges. Uh, our domestic courts uh, in the UK are not immune from such judicial activism. In 2015, the majority of the Supreme Court held that Prince Charles's letters to ministers should be published in the face of an apparently clearly worded section of the Freedom of Information Act, which gave ministers a power to veto such release. Lord Wilson, one of the dissenting just justices, said that what the majority had done did not interpret the section, it rewrote it. Lord Hughes, the other dissenter, said that the rule of law is not the same as a rule that the courts must always prevail. For anyone interested in a cogent critique of this decision, I would recommend reading an article by Charles Moore, uh, last year's previous giver of this present lecture in The Telegraph, which is still available online. Of more wide-reaching impact was the ruling of the House of Lords in 2004 in the Uller case. Uh, Lord Bingham said, the duty of national courts is to keep pace with Strasbourg jurisprudence as it evolves over time, no more but certainly no less. He also said that the British courts are effectively bound to follow clear and consistent jurisprudence from Strasbourg. Uh, no such principles are to be found in the wording of Section 2 of the Human Rights Act 1998, uh, which merely requires courts to take account of Strasbourg case law. Uh, the other decision was heavily, and in my view, rightly criticised by Lord Irvin of Lair for departing from both the wording and the intention of Parliament when it passed the 1998 Act. Uh, but within our parliamentary system, such excesses of judicial power can at the end of the day be corrected, even if reform of the Human Rights Act is controversial and politically difficult and therefore likely to take some time. The really serious problem of judicial activism arises not in our domestic courts, but in international courts and tribunals where it is rampant and almost impossible to check. I will refer only briefly to the Luxembourg Court, the Court of Justice of the European Union, since we should now escape its jurisdiction when we leave the European Union. I say should rather than shall, because of the danger, despite the clear words of the Prime Minister's party conference speech, of various fudges being proposed under which we continue to be bound directly or indirectly by the rulings of that court. I think that we should draw a clear line. 
Where Parliament chooses to continue as part of our domestic law, the substance of the measure which originally came from the European Union, it is natural that our courts should continue to look at jurisprudence from the Luxembourg Court interpreting that measure in the same way as they would look at decisions of Commonwealth uh, courts which interpret statutes which are similar to statutes passed by our own Parliament. That would be treating Luxembourg decisions as potentially persuasive but non-binding authorities. But in no way should we accept any form of binding legal effects from judgments of this court after we have left the European Union. The Luxembourg Court over its history has been almost a paradigm case of judicial activism. Its case law has gone in different directions at different times, but its consistent driving force has been to expand the powers of the supranational institutions at the expense of those of the nation states by claiming to interpret treaties and other instruments purposefully. In 2008, the Lisbon Treaty gave full legal effect to the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Since then, the Luxembourg Court has seized upon this wide-ranging and vaguely drafted instrument. Uh, it is ruled that a special protocol negotiated by Gordon Brown and claimed by him to give the UK an opt-out from the Charter does no such thing. And indeed, on the Court's ruling, seems to be a piece of waste paper which changes nothing at all. In 2012, um, in the Test Ashak case, uh, it struck down as contrary to the Charter a derogation in a directive that permitted the UK and others to continue to allow insurers uh, to charge different premiums where this was based on statistical differences between the sexes. Thus, young female drivers must now be charged higher premiums in order to cross-subsidise the risks posed by boy racers. Uh, and in 2013, in the uh, ackerberg Franson case, it gave an enormously broad interpretation to the phrase when they are implementing union law uh, in Article 51 of the Charter, uh, which defines when the Charter can be invoked against member states. This decision has drawn protests from the Federal German Constitutional Court. However, uh, looking across the Atlantic, the omens are not good for the residual independence of the member states in the matter of fundamental rights. Uh, the US Bill of Rights was originally intended and appears from its wording to restrict the powers and organs of the federal government, not the states. Mm -hmm. However, over time, it came to be judicially interpreted to bind the states as well. Um, nor uh, is the judicial activism of the Luxembourg court necessarily a good thing for fundamental rights. When fundamental rights come into collision with the interests of European integration, it is quite happy to override them. Uh, this can be seen in the 2013 Maloney case, where the court in effect ordered Spain to hand over an individual under a European arrest warrant, despite the fact that the Spanish constitution prohibited the extradition of a person convicted in an absentia, unless he would have the right to reopen conviction, which Italian law did not permit. Uh, the potential, and more than the potential, for differences in the approach to fundamental rights between the Luxembourg Court and the Strasbourg Court has led to a collision. <clears throat> in its opinion number two of 2013, the Luxembourg Court ruled on the draft agreement under which the European Union was to accede to the Convention on Human Rights. This agreement had been painfully negotiated between the European Union and its members and the other member states of the Council of Europe and defined the respective roles of the Luxembourg and Strasbourg courts in human rights cases involving the European Union or member states when they're applying the EU law. Uh, the Luxembourg court threw out the draft agreement, threw out the draft agreement on the grounds that it infringed its own sole prerogative to rule on European Union law in a number of respects. Uh, to an outside observer, uh, this internecine conflict between two self-aggrandizing and activist courts um, can only be viewed in the same way as it is said that Americans viewed the war between Saddam Hussein's Iraq and, and the Iran of the Ayatollahs. <laughs> a desire that it should go on as long as possible and that both sides should lose. <laughs> um, when we leave the European Union, EU law will formally cease to be part of our law and will cease to bind or to empower our courts. It does not follow that our courts and the legal profession will unlearn some of the 
ideas and behaviour which they have acquired during our long membership of the European Union. In particular, the concept of resorting to the courts in order to seek to overturn democratically reached decisions has become commonplace. Many examples could be given. Even where such challenges are ultimately unsuccessful, they can cause serious delays and frustrate the democratic process. There are many cases that could be mentioned, but one example in particular is instructive. In 2012, the Scottish Parliament passed the Alcohol Minimum Pricing Act. Its purpose was to combat the serious social problem in Scotland of excessive consumption of some high-strength alcoholic drinks currently sold very cheaply. Under the Act, the Scottish Government proposed to make an order setting the minimum price at 50 pence per unit of alcohol. The legislation was challenged by the Scotch Whisky Association and by two European wine and spirits bodies. It is important to note that the legislation does not discriminate between Scottish or other UK alcoholic drinks and drinks imported from other member states. The same minimum price rule applies to all. However, the case was deemed to involve the European angle on the tenuous grounds that setting a minimum price might reduce the ability to compete of producers of really, really cheap drinks. Uh, as a result, um, the Scottish courts referred the case to the Luxembourg court who ruled in effect that the Scottish courts must conduct a detailed review of the merits and justification of the minimum alcohol price measure as against alternative possible measures such as a tax increase. So EU law as interpreted by the Luxembourg court displaces democratic elected ministers and legislators and requires their functions effectively be carried out by judges instead. Since this, this act of the Scottish Parliament was a, a flagship measure of that Parliament uh, which has now been comprehensively derailed by over-interpreted EU law, uh, the continued adulation of EU membership by the Scottish First Minister, <laughs> that seems more than strange. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now that was a meritless challenge, and is a continuing meritless challenge, by commercial interests. But regularly there are challenges by pressure groups and others, all of which have a common theme. They are unable to prevail through the democratic process, so they turn to the courts in the hope of overturning or thwarting democracy. After we leave the European Union, the potential of such challenges under the Human Rights Act will remain. Um, so I will turn to the Strasbourg Court. That court is, interpreted, is entrusted with interpreting and applying the Convention. The court is empowered to interpret the law. It has no formal power to make law, other than limited power to make rules governing its own procedure. Nonetheless, making law is exactly what it has done, and it has effectively transformed the Convention of 1952 into something quite different from its original meaning. Uh, largely, this has been justified on the, on the basis that the Convention should be a living instrument. The suggestion that something should be a living instrument, as opposed by implication to a dead or lifeless instrument, is be beguiling and superficially appealing. And it is important to explain why this doctrine is flawed and indeed pernicious. Are all written instruments, whether statutes, constitutions, or an international charter of rights of this kind, need to be interpreted in circumstances which can change over time. For example, the former president of the Strasbourg Court, Sir Nicholas Bratzer, appearing before the House of Commons Select Committee, pointed out that emails were unknown in 1952, but reference in Article 8 of the Convention to the right to respect private correspondence should not be read as excluding emails. Indeed, that is right. Uh, but not because there is any need to interpret the Convention as a living instrument. For example, the prohibition in Section 78 of the Highways Act 1835 against the furious driving of any carriage uh, was interpreted well into the 20th century as covering means of transporting oneself along the highway unknown in 1835. Uh, neither this example nor the example of Article 8 being applied to emails are cases where the legal norm has been changed. They're examples of applying an unchanged legal norm to different facts and circumstances which arise over the course of time. 
A slightly more subtle point arises in provisions which import the application of a standard. Thus, Article 8 of the Bill of Rights 1689 prohibits the infliction of cruel and unusual punishment. Does this mean cruel and unusual by the standards of 1689, or cruel and unusual by the standards of the time when it is applied? There is nothing incongruous in the Parliament of 1689 having intended by the words it used that punishment should not be inflicted which are cruel and unusual by the standards of the time when they come to be inflicted. This again is not, a, not an example of living instrument interpretation, it is the interpretation of an unvarying legal norm in different times and circumstances. So-called living instrument interpretation is used to justify something quite different. <coughs> that is the creation and application of new or changed legal norms uh, which are not present in the instrument being interpreted. Two examples of such interpretation of the Convention can be given. First, a, a well-known one, votes for prisoners. Article 3 of the Convention's first protocol states that the, the high contracting parties undertake to hold free elections at reasonable intervals by secret ballot, under conditions which will ensure the free expression of the opinion of the people in the choice of the legislature. It should be noted that this article does not mention the right of any individual to vote. Insofar as it may give rise to individual rights at all, this is simply a general right to have elections held under conditions which ensure the free expression of the opinion of the people. It differs markedly from the series of articles in the body of the Convention, such as the right to liberty in Article 5, the right to respect private and family life in Article 8, and the right to freedom of expression in Article 10, all of which explicitly create rights for individuals and then qualify them with the circumstances in which they can legitimately be restricted. Yet the Strasbourg Court uh, has created out of Article 3 of this protocol an elaborate structure of legal rules, under which individuals have the right to vote, but that right may be restricted in some but not other circumstances. In particular, the court thinks that a state may prevent some prisoners from voting, but not, but for some reason, the logic of which defies me, all prisoners. Neither the right to vote itself, nor the basis for any potential restrictions or qualifications to that right, are to be found in the wording of the Convention. They are purely the invention of the court itself. In addition, the work of Dominic Brown has demonstrated that the Diplomatic Conference drafting Article 3 decided not to include the provision conferring the individual right to vote in the face of the objections of the British delegation, uh, who cited the difficulties created by then, uh, in the language of the day, exclusion from voting um, of felons, lunatics, and peers of the realm. <laughs> 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 uh, and there could hardly be a clearer case of the Strasbourg Court exceeding the bounds of the interpreting the Convention, which it is entrusted to interpret, and instead creating new legal norms which were, are not in the Convention, were not intended to be created by the states who drafted and acceded to the Convention. This is pernicious for a number of reasons. First, it means that such a legal norm is devoid of political and constitutional authority. When it is asked why a state should be bound by the terms of an international convention, the answer is because the state has agreed to be bound and has voluntarily chosen to restrict its own sovereignty. When that convention is then interpreted so as to contain new obligations which the state never agreed to be bound by, there is no legitimate basis for limiting its sovereignty. That in turn has the effect of removing an issue from the democratic decision-making pro process and judicialising it. Democracy is ousted and lawyers and judges take over. Clearly, there are arguments for and against allowing prisoners to vote, or about which prisoners should vote if not all are to be allowed to do so. They are for Parliament to decide according to our democratic processes. Let me turn to my second major example which is the extraterritorial application of the Convention, in particular its application to theatres of military operations outside the United Kingdom. 
Here again, there is a clear case of the Strasbourg Court creating a new legal norm with no basis in the Convention itself. Article 1 of the Convention states that the high contracting parties shall secure to everyone in their jurisdiction the rights and freedoms in the Convention. That should be borne in mind that when the Convention was drafted, both the UK and some other participating states had extensive dependent and colonial territories, and the idea of a Convention applying to all the territories controlled by those states, as distinct from their home territories, would have been absurd. This is confirmed by the terms of Article 56, uh, using the present numbering that's been renumbered, of course, uh, which is headed territorial application. Uh, this entitled states to notify the Secretary General to extend the application of the Convention to all or any of the territories uh, for whose international relations it is responsible. Thus, as regards the United Kingdom, it is clear that the Convention applied to the UK itself and to the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man and Gibraltar, uh, in respect of which the UK lodged notifications under Article 56. Uh, the Convention did not apply to other territories around the world, even if fully under the control of the United Kingdom, but for which it had not given a notification. Uh, it would therefore have been an absurdity to interpret it as applying to other areas outside the United Kingdom's territories where the UK had more limited powers of control, such as areas of foreign countries under temporary military occupation. <laughs> Uh, yet, in a series of judgments, the Strasbourg Court has interpreted the Convention as applying to areas outside the territory of the contracting states, if they exercise some form of control. This has given rise to serious and practical problems, such as the inability to deal appropriately with prisoners of war in Afghanistan or Somali pirates. Regrettably, our own courts have followed the Strasbourg judgments and extended the reach of the Human Rights Act outside the territory of the United Kingdom to follow the Strasbourg Court's interpretation of the reach of the Convention. In addition to being manifestly contrary to the provisions of the Convention, which govern its territorial application, uh, these Strasbourg cases give rise to a further absurdity. That is, that is that the collection of rights and freedoms in the Convention uh, may be appropriate to peacetime conditions in the European state, but are inappropriate or even impossible to apply in the case of temporary military occupation or control. Uh, there are relevant and more appropriate international laws which apply in such circumstances. For example, uh, the Geneva Convention obligation of an occupying power to safeguard the civilian uh, population. Uh, however, there is manifest absurdity in the idea uh, that occupying military forces are obliged, for example, to set up a system of courts and tribunals for the determination of civil rights and obligations fully compliant uh, with the terms of Article 6 uh, of the Convention on Fair Trials uh, and Article 5 of the Convention on the Right to Liberty lists a number of permissible grounds for detaining people, such as to face criminal charges. Notably, it contains no exception permitting the detention of prisoners of war or others who need to be detained for reasons of security during a military occupation. This problem was confronted by the Strasbourg Court in Hassan against the United Kingdom in 2014, when, where a prominent member of Saddam's regime had been detained by British forces in Iraq. The court, in fact, ruled in favour of the UK. The actual outcome of the case is welcome. However, the court reached this result not by accepting the obvious uh, illogicality and unsustainability of its doctrine of extraterritorial application of the Convention, but by purporting to interpret Article 5 of the Convention as being impliedly modified by state practice to contain a limitation not written into the text of the article. Uh, uh, this implied limitation uh, permits the detention of prisoners of war civilians who pose a risk to security during a military occupation. Um, and the problem with this kind of approach is that it increases yet further the scope for judicial rewriting the Convention under the guise of interpretation. It increases the risks of, for example, British forces acting in good faith and in accordance with their understanding of the law at the time in a difficult and dangerous situation 
but being retrospectively found to be in breach of legal rights through some unpredictable interpretation of convention rights by the Strasbourg Court. The government's recent announcement that it intends to derogate from the convention in the event of future military op op operations is therefore to be welcomed. This is the best it can do without amending primary legislation. Uh, but as and when the Human Rights Act is reformed, it should be made explicitly clear that the new Bill of Rights, which places it, does not extend outside <coughs> the territory of the United Kingdom, or, if it does so, that it extends only in a limited and appropriate way. I believe that I have demonstrated that there is a fundamental problem with the approach of the Strasbourg Court to the rule of law. That is that the members of the court do not see themselves as bound or restricted by the intentions of the member state as expressed in the wording of the convention and its protocols, or by the limited nature of the power of interpretation with which they are entrusted. By and large, those who seek election to the Strasbourg Court will be enthusiasts for the protection of human rights. Further, the court differs from the higher courts and supreme courts of states, where normally the judges will need to balance the protection of rights uh, against other factors which they are responsible, such as the security of citizens and upholding law and order. Uh, as a rights-only court, uh, which consists of self-selected pro-rights judges, uh, the Strasbourg Court lacks the institutional factors which would provide balance. These factors are aggravated uh, by the limited legal qualifications and limited intellectual capacities of the judges from at least some states. Uh, I fear, in consequence, that the prospect of reforming this particular court or of returning it to upholding the rule of law rather than undermining it is beyond remote. It is understandable that the focus of the government and the present parliament uh, should now be on exit from the European Union. Uh, that will require the passage of legislation of some complexity. This will regrettably be opposed by more than pockets of resistance by those who wish to overturn the result of the referendum, either by blocking exit or by creating a form of nominal exit under which we, will still, we are still subject to the rules of the European Union. Therefore, reforming the Human Rights Act and our relationship with the Convention must necessarily take its place in the queue behind that process. Nonetheless, it is still important that this be tackled in the present Parliament in accordance with the Conservative Election Manifesto. Uh, in this country, we have the longest and deepest tradition of the protection of rights and liberties of any country on earth. We do not need to outsource the protection of our rights and liberties to foreign institutions, still less to allow our courts and even Parliament to continue to be overruled by anti-democratic and legally unfounded foreign rulings. Therefore, we need to replace the Human Rights Act with a new Bill of Rights, which will allow our Parliament to work harmoniously with our courts in the protection of our rights and liberties as soon as circumstances permit. Thank mm -hmm. you.